Okay. Less than a minute. Oh, I turn this off. I don't think you could even hear that. I'm going to try to add that ability to have pre-show music because I like the concept. Excuse me. All right. For whatever reason. There we go. I don't like the way the light's bouncing. Welcome to our first, oh, thanks. Dismiss the timer. Welcome to our first live remote lecture, um, coming to you live from the Limerick neighborhood in historic old Louisville. Luckily, we're about a block away from where the historic district starts, so we don't have all the same restrictions that everybody else does to the south of us. Okay, so we're gonna pick up where we left off on Friday, I was getting into the fimbrae and pili features of some bacteria. Most bacteria will have something like this. And let me move off of here so I'm not looking at myself. Okay. Okay, so fimbrae are generally uh, very short, uh, bristle-like proteins that project from the cell wall and they are primarily used for attachment which is one of the first steps required for a pathogen in order to be able to infect. Now pili, uh, these tend to be longer. One of the most common ones is the F pilus or the sex pilus, uh, the F standing for fertility, bringing us the conjugation, the bacterial sex. Okay, I'll do it like this. All right, now group A strep. So in 1933, it was Rebecca Lancefield who proposed a method for serotyping uh, various beta hemolytic strains of Streptococcus species using an agglutination assay. Now, hemolysis is the ability of an organism to destroy red blood cells, if I speak most generally. Beta hemolysis refers to complete hemolysis. There's another type called alpha that leaves like a greenish cast um, around the colony because it doesn't completely eat the red blood cells. And then there's a gamma hemolysis, which is, is no hemolysis. So anyway, in 1933, we have this agglutination assay. So it's just observing how things clump up. Oh, well, like it says right here, technique using the clumping of bacteria to detect specific cell surface antigens. So she discovered that one group of Streptococcus pyogenes, so this is the pathogen that is usually the cause of strep throat, uh, found in group A, uh, was associated with a variety of human disease. She determined that various strains of group A strep could be uh, distinguished from each other based on variation in specific cell surface receptors that she called M proteins. We have about 80 different strains of group A strep now based on M proteins, so we still use this to this day. Oh, streptococcal uh, infections, probably. I cut that off. That's annoying. All right, so flagella. These are the structures of motility. This allows cells to move in an aqueous environment. So these act like propellers and they act like motors in a way that's, okay, I find pretty amazing. Uh, ATP synthase is the molecule that is super cool uh, when you see it in action. But this is really amazing because this is, so we have this labeled like a stator and we have the rotating part uh, portion on the inside 
And this is based on the type 3 secretion system initially. Uh, gram positive and gram negative do have a few differences here. Obviously, you have to get through an outer membrane by the thick cell wall. But anyway, we have a stator and we have a rotor. And it, this uses protein, uh, proton motive force, proton motive force to drive the rotor. So it literally induces movement uh, in a way, way almost identical to how motors work. Yeah. Okay. Now these flagella can occur in different arrangements. They do occur in different arrangements. And so flagella that tend to have only one flagellum is called monotrichus. And uh, vibrio cholera is an example of this. And so cells with amphitrichus flagella have one on each end. That's pretty cool. That's perillum minor is an example. This is the cause of Asian rat bite fever, which is spelled uh, sodoku, 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 not sudoku. So just that O U there. At first, I thought it was spelled the same. I was like, haha. No, it's not. So some cells have a tuft of flagella at one end, and that's Lophotrichus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is um that's something that we're gonna mention a lot this semester because uh, it can cause a lot of opportunistic infections i'm still getting used to having the monitor right back in my ear uh, like swimmer's ear burn wound infection it has this style of flagella and then flagella that cover the entire cell are peritrichus Now movement, this is really fun. I gotta make sure I can find that little video and play it for you. If I can't do it now, I'll try to do it. Well, no, we'll keep moving forward. Anyway, bacterial movement is based on either running or tumbling. So when the flagella are rotating counterclockwise, that's a run. All the, if in the case of multiple flagella, they will sort of work together and they'll provide a propelling force in, um, in the same direction. When they are instead tumbling, when the rotation of, of the flagella is clockwise, they will be uncoordinated and just kind of rotate in place. So since they don't have, well, they, don't, they can't steer per se, uh, they can either move or spin. Kind of like they're really, you can still buy them. You know those remote control cars that uh, only have that option where you can either turn or go. You can do both at the same time, but you can't reverse. You can't really do anything fancy with them. Bacteria can't. So their movement is in response to signals in their environment. It could be light, which would be phototaxis. Could be magnetic fields, uh, magnetotaxis, and those are the ones that have the inclusions that are magnetosomes, right? But more commonly, it's going to be in response to a chemical gradient, so chemotaxis. Now, they could either be attracted to, like a food source, if it finds itself in a gradient of glucose, uh, it's going to tend to move towards the source of that glucose uh, or if it's um, a harmful chemical it might try to run away from it and the way it does this is by uh, if it's going in the direction of a favorable chemical the lengths of its run will be longer and the duration of tumbling will be shorter if instead it needs to get away then it will run in that direction towards the increasing gradient of, of toxin, let's call it. Uh, the runs will be a lot shorter, the tumbles will be longer. And let's see if I have this video handy. 
I do, I think. Let's open with, I don't know why you're giving me that option. Oh, because I didn't choose it last time, that's fine. Let's see if I can open this with VLC Media Player. Okay, I don't want to download that. So yeah, this is what I was looking for. Okay. So here's a little movie where we've recorded runs and tumbles. Okay, great. Let me give you a chance to go back. There we go. So see, you've got the time. It's tumbling. Then it's doing a run. That's pretty cool. Okay, so that is bacterial movement. Yeah, again, runs and tumbles. So here's a cartoon of that. The run towards an attractant. And then if it's running away from an attractant that's going to have a shorter run. It's going to tumble. See, this was kind of a neutral. If our imaginary gradient starts up here and goes this way. So this was neutral, so the run wasn't very long. And then it tumbles again, and then, you know, whatever. Anyway, that's kind of fun. I like it. So here's a summary prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. I will address some of this briefly. So bacteria will tend to have single chromosome, but that's not universal. Um, Radiobacter has about eight. Agrobacterium has two and they are linear. Haploid is pretty fair to say. And they don't have histones. Uh, but they have a nuclear associated proteins whereas archaea has histones that was one of the clues uh, leading towards um, the <laughs> conclusion that archaea and eukaryotes share a more recent common ancestor than bacteria and eukaryotes okay so archaea again tend to have a singular single chromosome it tends to be circular, they tend to be haploid, and it contains histones. And of course, eukaryotes have multiple chromosomes, linear, and they can be haploid or diploid, or have lifestyles that cycle between the two in about equal proportions. So cell division, uh, binary fission in prokaryotes, mitosis, meiosis in eukaryotes, peptidoglycan, or no cell walls in bacteria. And then in archaea, we have pseudopeptidoglycan, or a large variety of things here. Oh, and something interesting about some archaea is that their membrane is uh, sometimes monolayered instead of a bilayer. So eukaryotes, obviously, we have cellulose, chitin, silica. Uh, mostly, we don't have cell walls in eukarya. Now, motility structures, we have uh, flagella, composed of flagellin, uh, that are rigid. And the rigid spiral flagella, composed of archaeal flagellins. Whereas in eukaryotes, the flagella are flexible, so they do the wave motion, they don't spin. And, of course, cilia, that just go back and forth. Those are composed of microtubules. Uh, no membrane-bound organelles for prokaryotes, uh, but yes for eukaryotes. No endomembrane system, and of course the eukaryotes do. Ribosomes are 70s and then 80s for the eukaryotes in the cytoplasm and the rough ER, but they have 70s in the mitochondria and chloroplasts. All right, so section four, unique characteristics of the eukaryotic cells. I'm going to kind of summarize uh, all this stuff.
Okay, so cell theory, because you're going to have that in cell um, a lot. <laughs> you're going to spend a lot of time on this stuff. All right, so the learning objectives here are to explain the distinguishing characteristics of eukaryotic cells, describe the internal and external structures of prokaryotic cells in terms of their physical structure, chemical structure, and function. Huh. Identify and describe structures of an organelles unique to eukaryotic cells. Compare and contrast similar structures found in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So here's our generic animal cell. There is no one cell that looks quite like this. This is just a cartoon uh, displaying all the common features that are all the possible features in eukaryotic cells. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so eukaryotic cells, uh, so they're all distinguished, are all defined by the presence of a nucleus surrounded by a complex nuclear membrane. Some of you will have classes later on that will go into great detail on the gatekeeping functions of the nuclear pore that is supposed to help prevent the wrong ones from coming in. The wrong, uh, well, you know, some viruses are able to get in there, but not any of them can. And then there's a gatekeeping function to prevent immature messenger RNA from being released too. It's quite um, interesting. All right, so membrane-bound organelles in the cytoplasm, uh, mitochondria, the ER, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, peroxisomes, all these things are held in place by this cytoskeleton. Do I want to do this on this kind? Of... Yeah, I'll tell you anyway since we're here. So my high school, I went to Reedland High School, uh, we had a biology teacher that um, used the God in the gaps argument uh, in that he claimed that we didn't know how the organelles were held in the cell, uh, though the cytoskeleton had been discovered by then. This wasn't like, you know, ancient times. It was in the, well, it is now, effectively. It's the 80s. Yeah, so that's not true. Um, all these things are organized and held in place by a dynamic cytoskeleton. Okay, so... Uh, summary of cell structures. So remember, bacteria and archaea tend to be in the one. That's funny. That's capital M like molar. <laughs> it should be a lowercase m. Okay, micrometer. And then you carry its range up to 20 micrometers. So roughly a factor of 10 plus. So prokaryotes have a high surface area to volume ratio. Eukaryotes have a low, and no nucleus. Yeah, okay, sorry. That's, we just went through this. We did, didn't we? Yes, we did. Okay, cell morphologies in eukaryotes. These are varied. So we have our spheroids. We have our uh, fusiform shape. And, uh, and there's a bell shape, vorticella, ovoid, or paramecium, which you mostly all can probably draw from memory, uh, and the ring shaped plasmodium uh, ovale. Some of these obviously are human pathogens that we're going to go over at some point. So again, the nucleus, we have a well-defined nucleus. And here's a picture of one from a mammalian lung cell. It's a large dark oval shape in the lower half of the image. So with this fluorescent microscope image, all the intermediate filaments have been stained with a bright green. So you see the intermediate filaments all through here. And the nuclear lamina is the intense bright green ring around the faint red nucleus nuclei. The nucleolus is the dark dense area within the nucleus. This is the site of ribosomal RNA synthesis and pre-ribosomal assembly. And then here's the nucleolus in the transmission electron micrograph. 
So the ribosomes, we have the small unit, we have this large subunit, we have transfer RNA, transfer RNA brings in, uh, when it's charged, charged tRNA will have an amino acid attached. This is demonstrating the uh, P site, where the growing polypeptide chain has already been attached to the incoming amino acid. This would be the exit site. This would be the A site, the first site. There would be another amino acid or transfer RNA carrying an amino acid and coming into this site. So but we do have you know ribosomes in common for uh, all living things. The endomembrane system, we have a series of membranous intracellular structures that facilitate the movement of material through the cell and to the cell membrane, as in that cartoon I showed you, the inner life of the cell. And is there anything, do I want to see? So yeah, I will right now. So. You've probably already learned that the, you have the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. These, um, the rough part, uh, this, this is only the ribosome caught in the picture being bound to the ER. These are not permanent affectations. These are temporary. They um, associate with the messenger RNA they bind to the port that um, the ribosome will start translating directly into the lumen of the ER. But then when it uh, completes translation, it disassociates and floats apart. Yeah, okay. So again, the rough ER is studied with the ribosomes, right? The synthesis of membrane proteins, not only membrane proteins, but anything membrane bound does need to be produced in this way because you um, run it through the membrane of the ER and that gets pinched off and transported to the uh, plasma membrane. But other types of proteins that need more modifications or can't take on their final conformation in the cytosol will be um, chaperoned inside the ER. Oops. So the Golgi apparatus, glycosylation and other post-translational modifications take place here. And let's see. Yeah, that's fine. So peroxisomes. They play a role in lipid biosynthesis and the breaking down of various molecules. There we are. So the cytoskeleton, we have th three major types of cytoskeletal elements. We have the microtube, microfilament, and intermediate filaments. So the microtube is made of uh, tubulin dimers we have actin subunits that make up microfilaments and then a fibrous subunit, so keratins coiled together. So microfilaments, uh, these are highly dynamic fibers. Let me see, where am I going over here? There we go. That contribute to amoeboid movement and also involved in cytoplasmic streaming. These are able to assemble and disassemble very rapidly. And you see they're able to contract. So uh, yeah, the association with myosin allows microfilaments to be involved in a variety of cellular processes, including uh, yeah, contractile ring formation during cell division and muscle contraction in animals. So intermediate filaments, uh, these are a group of filaments that act as cables within the cell. Uh, they are termed intermediate because their 10 nanometer size is between uh, that of actin but thinner than microtubes. So we have several strands of polymerized subunits. 
that are in turn made up of a wide variety of monomers. So they tend to be more permanent and maintain the position of the nucleus. They also form the nuclear uh, lamina. This is nuclear pore complex. Okay, there we go. Intermediate filaments along the inside. They also play a role in anchoring cells together. So keratin, uh, well, that's is an intermediate filament protein, and it is obviously our hair, skin, and nails. It's a structural component thereof. All right, microtubules. So you see this has the same animation or based on the same animation that I showed you. So these are hollow structures composed of polymerized tubulin dimers. So these are, um, each ring, I guess, is made of uh, 13 polymerized dimers of alpha and beta tubulin. So these guide the movement of organelles throughout the cytoplasm, and then motor proteins are able to move along their length. And these make up um, flagella and cilia and eukaryotes, composing both the filament and the basal body. So this uh, dynin and kinesin are the motor proteins used to move vesicles along the microtubes. All right, another major structure in eukaryotic cells is the centrosome composed of centrioles. So these serve as microtube organizing centers of the mitotic spindle during mitosis. And then the mitochondria that occurs in the vast majority of eukaryotes, but not all. So we have the inner membrane, the outer membrane, we have the cristae. So we have these deep invaginations that increases the surface area across which ATP can be made. And then we share that with the host cell. And then chloroplasts, of course, for photosynthetic eukaryotes. This has also has a double membrane system and features uh, thylakoids stacked in granum. So mitochondria related organelles and protozoan parasites. So two uh, protozoan parasites, we have Giardia lamblia, which is highly infectious. It requires only uh, one protozoan to cause an infection in a human. And then Trichomonas vaginalis is an example of uh, a protozoan that is lacking a recognizable mitochondria. Yeah, okay. So Giardia, so diarrhea in humans and other animals. It's an anaerobic parasite, possesses two nuclei and several of flagella. So being anaerobic is kind of a clue. Huh. So its Golgi apparatus and ER are greatly reduced and it lacks mitochondria completely but it does have a mitosome. So it's double membrane bound organelle that appears to be a severely reduced mitochondria. So the idea is that Giardia's ancestor once had a mitochondria that became the mitosome. Meanwhile, Trichomonas vaginalis, which causes vaginitis, is another protozoan parasite that lacks conventional mitochondria. Instead it has a high hydrogenosomes, mitochondria-related double membrane-bound organelles that produce molecular hydrogen using cellular metabolism. So again, the thought is that these also originated as mitochondria ancestrally and have changed over time. All right, plasma membrane. There we go. So in eukaryotic cells, the structure of the plasma membrane is uh, similar to the prokaryotic plasma membrane in that we have a phospholipids uh, forming a bilayer with embedded peripheral and integral proteins. 
So these membrane components, they move around um, as per the fluid mosaic model. The eukaryotic membranes contain sterols, including cholesterol, that alter membrane fluidity, which is unlike prokaryotes. So many eukaryotes contain uh, specialized lipids, including sphingolipids, that are thought to play a role in maintaining uh, membrane stability, as well as being involved in single transduction and cell-to-cell uh, -cell com communication. So membrane transport mechanisms, these are probably going to be familiar to you all. So in general, we have phagocytosis, where a large particle is uh, taken in to the cell. When it's just small particles, I would call that pinocytosis, which is cell drinking. And then, of course, we have receptor-mediated endocytosis. So these are regulated and yeah. So extracellular matrix is, well, now we've understood it to be very important for a lot of years now. <laughs> so uh, this can be made of a bunch of different materials um, from the cell walls, but here we're talking about the extracellular matrix for the cells of animals and some protozoans lacking cell walls. So this is in general like a sticky mass of carbohydrates and proteins into the space between adjacent cells. So let's see if I can grab that. I'm oh, sorry, it's loud. extracellular matrix derived from the pig's bladder Ugh. and this is this was like 10 years ago initially and there's still people working on this let's see Rodriguez first made headlines in 2013 when a horse bit off the index finger of Paul Halpern 33 year old horse trainer so that's the second story uh, the initial story was f a few years further back, and it was an airplane, uh, airplane propeller accident. So he built a rough mold of Halpern's missing fingertip using commercially available medical patch made of pig bladder. So there is a commercially available medical patch that's made of it. Interesting. So in uh, 2013, so in 2011, uh, the technique was developed by Stephen uh, Badilak. It was the late 80s that that was discovered. So that was even further back. So I'm not going to go through all this, but this is still being researched. I thought maybe it was something that had been abandoned, but it has not. That's good. So the extracellular matrix, in the case of this, these uh, regenerating parts of the fingertip, uh, are able to serve as a signaling, um, as an inducer, I guess, to regrowth. So the cells that are remaining from the little, the shortened finger, uh, start growing into that space because of the. Uh, extracellular matrix proteins involved. So flagella and cilia in eukaryotes, so these are flexible. They don't have the same uh, hook arrangement that occurs in prokaryotes. Oops, I'm not mean to do that. Here we go. There we go. That's flagellin. For... Oops, that's, here we... that's chapter four. Four, that's not what I want. There we are. So there's a standard nine plus two array that, um, again, you'll have to know for cell for sure. But you have two in the middle and nine pairs uh, are surrounding it. So it's nine pairs and then one pair in the middle. 
and this causes this the movement of the flagella is caused by the sliding of these microtubes relative to each other we have a picture of the trichomonas vaginalis the flagellated protozoan parasite yes so paramecium have numerous cilia that aid in locomotion as well as feeding we got the mouth opening shown there but the nine plus two that's an arrangement you'll have to know at some point so it's dynin is the motor protein used to facilitate this movement and this has a basal body it has a stator it has um well not really a rotor but well maybe it doesn't yeah it's completely different resolution so since amoxicillin has not resolved Barber's case of pneumonia, the physician's assistant prescribes another antibiotic, uh, azithromycin, which targets bacterial ribosomes rather than peptidoglycan, being part of the streptomycin family, which well, we'll talk about uh, later. So after taking it as directed, Barber's symptoms resolve and she finally begins to feel like herself again. Uh, preserving uh, no drug resistance to amoxicillin was involved and given the effectiveness of azithromycin the causative agent of Barber's pneumonia is most likely mycoplasma pneumonia even though this bacterium is a prokaryotic cell it is not inhibited by amoxicillin because it does not have a cell wall and therefore it does not make pep peptidoglycan at all all right and this is um one of the thoughts about ongoing antibiotic therapies is that we should perhaps be looking at uh, using a multi-drug approach at the very beginning, at the very beginning, very outset, instead of using a single antibiotic, because if something is singly resistant, you are only increasing its population if you feed it only the antibiotic it's resistant to because it'll kill off all of its competition so it'll actually help it and um, if you use multiple antibiotics it is less likely that any given pathogen will have resistance to all the antibiotics at once so it's a thought there all right let me see if i'm going to start in number four maybe a little bit Let's take a look. Let's shut that down. That's number three. Yes, I will save. Number four. All right, prokaryotic diversity is number four. So let's go into 4.1 just a little bit. There we go. So we have bacteria that live in basically every environment and they have a remarkable wide array of adaptations to survive in those environments. In this example, in this introduction, we're looking at uh, Shewanella, which lives in the deep sea where it um, actually does utilize some oxygen but it has these long appendages called nanocables to sense said oxygen in its environment. Okay, so the learning objectives in 4.1, identify and describe the unique examples of prokaryotes in various habitats on Earth, identify and describe symbiotic relationships, compare normal commensal resident microbiota to transient microbiota, explain how prokaryotes are classified oops here we go okay so here's a picture of the uh, dead sea we have bacteria that can thrive in there it's a very salty environment and these are halophiles That's, there's that word halophiles able to live in this extremely salty environment so our clinical focus, we have Marsha, a 20-year-old university student, recently returned to the United States from a trip to Nigeria, 
where she had interned as a medical assistant for an organization working to improve access to laboratory services for tuberculosis testing. When she returned, she began to feel fatigue, which she initially attributed to jet lag. However, the fatigue persisted and Marcia soon began to experience other bothersome symptoms, such as occasional coughing, night sweats, loss of appetite, and a low-grade fever of 37.4 degrees Celsius, 99.3 Fahrenheit. So she expected her symptoms would subside in a few days, but instead they gradually became more severe. About two weeks after returning home, she coughed up some sputum and noticed that it contained blood and small whitish clumps resembling cottage cheese. Her fever, her fever spiked to over 100. She began feeling sharp pains in her chest when breathing deeply. Concerned that she seemed to be getting worse, Marcia scheduled an appointment with her physician. Oh. I guess I'm going to call it here. Uh, we're going to go into nitrogen fixation on Wednesday. And uh, I will see you then. All right. Take care. Uh, wait. There's a clean way to do this. There.